Download the free PhysioTutors app now and become the best clinician you can be. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me today on um, my presentation on the masterclass on ACL injury rehabilitation in the paediatric athlete. So just a little bit about me. So uh, I'm on, as you look at the screen um, on the left side, um, uh, I'm a currently a director of the Youth Physiotherapy Clinic in Bath, England. Um, I'm also a consultant youth physiotherapist at Balance Performance Physiotherapy, which is based in London. Um, so my background, so I've got a master's in sports injury rehab from Salford University, um, a physiotherapy degree from St. George's Medical School in London, and I've worked for the England Athletics team since 2015, both nationally and internationally with variable age groups from under 15s up to under 20s. And a long time ago, I also did a, a BSc in Sport and Exercise Science from the University of Hertfordshire. So this is a bit of a content slide, what we're going to go through today. Um, so just going to cover a lot about the anatomy and growth, then going to some of the operations for the ACL uh, reconstruction, um, and then look at rehab, return to play, some modifiable factors uh, during and post rehab. Um, and secondary ACL rupture rates are uh, 2.7 times higher in adolescents than adults. Um, over the past several decades, the clinical need for data in paediatric orthopedics has increased in parallel with the increased di diagnosed ACL tears in the skeletally immature. The trend is multifactorial, um, but some of the reasons uh, could lead to increased participation in youth sports, sports specialization, year-round play, and increase in the number of adolescents competing at high levels. Um, and from my point of view, from what I see, I do see that there's a, an incredible high volume of sport in the sort of skeletally immature skeleton during a peak growth spurt with also an underdeveloped movement vocabulary. And I think this is uh, one of some of the reasons I'm seeing why we're seeing these injuries. So, Houston, we definitely have a problem with these high rates. Um, ACL injuries in children do create a, a significant level of concern um, than in any other population with ACL injury. Um, question is, do children who rupture their ACL mature similarly to their uninjured peers? So this all impacts on, on the type of operation, and that's where the importance of having a paediatric consultant who um, obviously understands the, the growth of a child. The closure of the proximal tibial epiphysis occurs in the following direction. So in the sagittal plane, it closes from a posterior to anterior direction. In the coronal plane, medial to lateral. And in the axial plane, a posterior, posterior medial to an anterior lateral direction. This was a study done by Cardoso in 2008. So he looked at um, uh, the ages um, of epiphyseal fusion around the body. So it's just another, it's a good landmark um, uh, study, but also to show you when you're treating uh, children, it gives you an idea about whether they're potentially still growing at certain areas uh, or whether they potentially have, uh, have fused. So this does change the certain age groups, but it's worth considering this when you're, um, uh, you're assessing or treating a child who has had this type of operation about where in their growth phase they might actually be. And this would be really important to liaise with the uh, the consultant with this as well. Via the testosterone, boys tend to increase the growth of bone and muscle with simultaneous decreased fat in the limbs. Um, and the maximal decrease in fat and increase in muscle mass in the upper arms does correspond to the timing of peak height velocity. As this height velocity reduces, fat accumulation resumes in both genders, but it's twice as rapid in girls versus boys. So again, just something to be considering where they potentially are within their growth phase um, about how this might impact on how they move and um, how they get on with their rehabilitation. And also, again, thinking about that return to play time frame. Peak height velocity timing is difficult to estimate due to its uh, dinural, postural and measurement variation. The timing of the peak height velocity does tend to correspond to about 90% of final height. The growth spurt does begin at about 85% of the peak adult height. Um, and then the growth tends to slow at about 96% of the peak adult height. And about 3.5 years after the peak growth, the remaining physes will close. So again, knowing where your child is at in their growth phase 
um, is incredibly important during the rehabilitation phase because you've got a child who is nearing maybe 12 to 18 months and you're thinking about return to play and there may be only 90 to 92 percent of their peak adult height and they're showing poor movement despite the fact that they're so far down the line is that the right time to put them back into sport or are you putting them back at a risk and during a really changeable time where the movement isn't optimal so this is a really important slide and a, a really important bit of information that we need to know and liaison with the consultants as well so then that's really important because um, if you can let them know your reasoning behind restricting that return to play, and this is a really valuable slide um, to discuss. Approximately 50% of injuries um, are, um, are bone injuries. Uh, it's more common with growth plate and avulsions being more common. So there's more increase in bone and growth plate injuries during periods of increased leg length. Uh, interestingly, with an increased maturity status, there's a decrease in growth plate injuries. However, in your later maturing athletes, there's an increased injury risk, and that could be due to an immature growth plate, but a greater exposure to more matches with age. So again, if your child is a late developer, having their age of reconstruction, um, and then they're going going back, but they're, they're, they're being seen in their chronological age, they might be playing more matches, more training than a younger child would. ACL injuries uh, have been shown to occur approximately 3.5 times more frequently in female athletes uh, with the onset of puberty. This has largely been attributed to hormonal and structural differences, um, but nothing concrete, and I think this is an area of research that is still ongoing. Mechanism of injuries generally related to neuromuscular recruitment patterns and landing techniques. Uh, and there has been some advice that in the early maturing girls who have not had coaching and fundamental movement skills, or the chance to develop expertise in sports-specific sports techniques, they may be particularly vulnerable. So I think it's our job as clinicians, um, and that's where our expert uh, expertism lies, that we're looking at these movement patterns and how these children are landing and moving. Very early on, as, as a top tip, I tend to look at the, uh, the contralateral side to the injury and look at how they're moving. And if it was a non-contact injury, um, like they were changing direction, what's the movement um, capacity on their non-injured side? And if you're seeing a, a side trunk lean, the knee valgus, they're wobbling around around the knee, or they, they're, they're looking at the floor, they're using their arms more, you're starting to think about, okay, we've got sort of a, a generalized area that we need to really improve on. So important when there has been an injury to an ACL about the management going forward. So uh, it's very important that the either yourself or the consultant does sort of a skeletal wage assessment. So really to define the remaining uh, knee growth. Um, open physis can be vulnerable to surgery. Um, and none of the current recommended surgical treatments for the child with an ACL injury can be guaranteed to protect the physis. Um, there's a recommendation of whether you would do long leg radiographs after the injury to establish a baseline for assessing the potential development of any angular deformity and leg length issues. But this will uh, be down to the consultant preference. So again, should we be modifying rehab in this scenario post ACL reconstruction and resetting our expectations on return to play? So really useful to discuss this with the child and really useful to discuss this with the parents as well because sometimes there's a real impetus to try and get these children back early sometimes they see they idolize their um their um some of the players in football teams and they're coming back incredibly quickly but we need to counsel and educate them on returning them at a safe time um and trying to reduce the risk of a secondary injury so as we discussed, well, the incidence of ligamentous injuries uh, increases with sort of advanced maturity, and it's most prevalent in the mature or post peak height velocity phase. Tends to be reason for this maybe due to disruptions in neuromuscular control, insufficient muscle capacity, and an imbalance in muscle and tendon growth. And also, there's increased moments of inertia in athlete segments, so that control of rotation could be affected as well. MRIs are used to identify any meniscal tears or other ligament injuries or any OCD injuries. And if they present with a locked knee, an MRI is uh, warranted to assist any displaced bucket handle tears or any uh, OCDs. So I think after having an injury, I think we need to be very transparent with the child and with the parent. 
Um, so we're charged with the responsibility of providing accurate information and effective treatment to this vulnerable population. We need to share the information about the potential consequences of an ASO injury and the treatment in childhood to long-term knee health. And this should be a really central part of that shared decision making. Adult patients with an ASO injury may go on to develop symptoms and signs of osteoarthritis within 10 years of the index injury. Um, and then there's a clinical concern. Is that, is that a child who is injured at the age of 10 years, could they have symptomatic arthritis by the age of 20 or 30? We don't quite know that yet, but that is um, research that uh, needs, needs to be done. So important when there has been an injury to an ACL about the management going forward. So I tend to really, I've got a group of consultants who are experts in paediatrics who understand the growing need and I always search them out for advice and refer on because that's really, really crucial. Uh, in ACE reconstruction, um, after a failed non-surgical management, it may lead to an increased number of meniscal and chondral injuries. So this is something to consider. Um, non-surgical treatment has been said to be, can be a viable and safe treatment option for skeletally immature patients who do not have associated injuries or major instability problems. Now, this can be quite controversial, but this was some of the research that I discovered. I did find an interesting study by ECAS in 2019, and they looked at the coping strategies of children into adulthood um, without an ACL reconstruction. So they went down a primary non-surgical approach, pending growth, and the option of a delayed ACL reconstruction. And this was without, was without any additional injuries at the time of diagnosis. The study was in a skeletally immature population. Their results were 45% of the children coped well, even to adulthood, without an ACL reconstruction. However, for the remaining 55% of the patients, a delayed ACL reconstruction was warranted, mainly due to instability. Interestingly, irrespective of the final treatment, most patients reported high um, PROM scores and did show near symmetrical muscle strength and hot performance at final follow-up. However, only 34% participated in pivoting sports at final follow-up. So if you look at the headlines there, 66% didn't get back to a period in sports and 55% required reconstruction eventually. I don't think that's a great result personally. And I also would question the fact that although they had high prom scores and symmetrical muscle strength and hot performance, as I'll discuss later, I don't think that's anywhere near enough for an adequate return to play uh, of a child or even an adult. So that's quite an interesting slide about, you know, considering and discussing with patients um, and parents and also with consultants. Um, so the risk of an ACE reconstruction, uh, it's rare. So um, growth is 2%. And um, secondary ACE rupture can be more common and it's more common at young ages. Those return to pivoting sport and any that have had an allograph. And we're not quite sure yet the long term clinical significance of these growth changes. So in the paediatric ACL graft, uh, the ACL graft must adapt as the child grows. The graft may increase in length as the bone grows and the tunnels may decrease in size. Um, longitudinal bone growth um, and the graft may become more vertical, which we discussed earlier. And there may be secondary endochondral knot narrowing, distal migration of tibial and or the proximal migration of the femoral extracortical fixation. And we're not quite sure yet the long-term clinical significance of these growth changes. And ACL grafts tend to decrease during the post-operative ligamentization process and do never return back to normal, their normal state. So this ligamentization is a progressive change in the intra-articular and tunnel portions of the graft. The duration depends on the microenvironment, the conditions near the tunnel, tendon stumps and Hoffer fat pad. It tends to occur later in the middle portion due to less favorable mechan mechanical conditions. Um, and ligamentization of the ACL grafts is seen in the post-operative MRI up to two years out from operation. Maturation of the graft does not result in an MRI signal like that of a normal ACL. And one of my other ones I've just chucked in there is that, you know, some fun stuff I'm looking at is that can a child forward roll into a single leg squat it's not easy. Try it. I challenge you to try it and see whether you can do that. So you roll onto your back, you roll forwards, and you try and come out of that into a single leg squat. 
and some of my best kids can do this. Um, and some of my kids that I see that do a, a lot of sport before having their injury and they're a little bit sport specialized and there's not really any time in the week for this free play challenge and their movements really, really struggle with this. And during that growth phase, especially the ones that are growing fast with a fast tempo, they sort of struggle with this quite a lot. And I would question if they can't do these sort of movement skills, is their body going to be adapted enough to return to the high demands of sport? So considering the skeletal age, so if they're under 85% of their peak cut, so if they haven't really started their growth spurt or puberty, we want to focus more on dynamic multi-joint neuromuscular control. Um, no need to do any hypertrophy-based training due to limited concentrations of anabolic hormones. So be out on the lookout for those patients that come to see you that are doing, um, they're lifting weights or they're doing uh, three times 15 to 20 they're not going to be adapted um, to be doing these type of uh, exercises. Uh, the other side of it as well that we need to consider is the changes in the nutrition as the athlete is going through puberty as well. So again, another um, person that you want in your team is a sports nutri nutritionist that has expertise in treat treating children. So I've got people that I refer to with this as well. And this might come out of your subjective um, chatting. You might talk to the parents. There might be certain issues with eating. Um, and it's a sensitive topic and you need to be sensitive with it. But um, I think it's very important that we don't ignore it because when you're putting a child back into sport or you're trying to get them to do their exercise and rehab, um, are they adequately, do they have adequate nutrition to be able to supplement that? So there's some ideas there on um, from peak um, calorie requirements. I'm I'm not advocating counting calories, but this is just um, some of what's needed in a child during the day. So I tend to say to my children, how many meals do you have a day? Do you have breakfast? What's your favorite food? Um, do you eat breakfast? So they're my general questions. If I start to pick up some anomalies like they're not eating breakfast, they're a really fussy eater, I don't like eating these things, then I'm thinking this might be appropriate for um, a nutrition intervention because this is outside of my scope, but it's just you being aware of some flags.